She's been called many things in her many years in the public eye. It girl, socialite, editor, author, baroness, columnist, wife. Four times on that one, actually. Barbara Emile's new autobiography is a surprisingly self-deprecating look at a life lived in the spotlight, occasionally a very harsh spotlight. The 600-pager is called Friends and Enemies, a memoir, and it brings Barbara Emile to our airwaves tonight from the provincial capital. So nice to see you. Thank you so much. Terrific to be here. You and I, we've only met once. We, we barely know each other, but uh, I thoroughly love this book, and I know you a lot better now. So shall we dive in? Let's, let's dive right in. Well, uh, let's just start with this. You know, you did say in the book you were quite reluctant to write your memoirs, and uh, I guess I want to know, for starters, what propelled you to finally say yes and do it? Um, I was reluctant because I always find the memoirs of people who haven't lived particularly extraordinary lives or accomplished something extraordinary rather boring, and you get these incredible anecdotes um, that really mean nothing. And that was my genuine reluctance. I didn't think I'd done enough with my life to write a memoir. What propelled me was that I am a writer, basically, and a journalist, and we use every writer, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, uses something of their own life for their writing. Um, even someone like Murakami, who wrote The Wind-Up Bird and Japanese Magic Realism, the part of their own life goes into the book. And so much was happening around me that it was partly a need to have a thread to sanity, and it was partly a need to understand as I have said before, was I really as horrible as everyone was saying? Because I don't think people keep saying you're horrible if you're not. I mean, not the, you know, sort of a hundred journalists can't be making up the fact that you're horrible. There must be something there. So I decided to sit down and write. Well, let's go, let's go through some of the story and then we can let our viewers decide one way or another how horrible you are, okay? <laughs> um, I do want to go back to England. As your accent suggests, you are from England originally, not a well-to-do home, and two parents, if I can put it this way, who were, who were clearly troubled people. How did you sort of manage your way through your childhood? I do think that in those days, which was the late 1940s and 50s, that you children really thought about whether their parents were troubled or not, or whether their life was extraordinary or not. You just got on with it. So... When, my, when I came home from school one day in Hamilton, Ontario, and I think I was about 14, and my things were packed in a cardboard box, I didn't put this in the book because it sounded just too ghastly dramatic. And I knew that I wasn't going to be staying at home any longer. I just thought that that was a wise decision of my stepfather's because my mother reacted very neurotically to my presence and I didn't want to upset him or her anymore. And from that point on, Steve, you just, you just carry on. You find jobs to support yourself. You look at the positive things in your life. No rules, no parents to tell you when to come home, what jobs you can or cannot take. Mm. And I think that in this country, in Canada, you can always find a job. I grant you that it might be more difficult at 14 and 15 today than it was then because there are labor laws. But I could get jobs... Um, in department stores, I could collect pop bottles, I could do anything. Today I'd probably go and get a job at Amazon or something like that in a delivery room where I'd wash dishes. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't unpleasant. I didn't sit home and cry. Well, um, okay, I gotta follow up on that then because because I'm imagining you at the age of, I don't know what you were, 15 maybe, when your mother called you and said, your mother said this to you, your father's dead. He killed himself. He went mad. I expect you'll go mad too. I mean, what does one think when one's mother says that? You know, the problem with doing interviews like this is that I have shut my mind to a lot of this. And after we finish this interview, I will go into a corner and probably cry. Um, I remember that moment very well. I was living in the house of a garage mechanic and he said, there's a telephone call for you downstairs. And I loved my father very much, and my whole life was centered around in earning enough money to go back to England and be with him and be Jewish again, actually. Um, and all I could do was think, oh, my father's dead. What, what would one do if one's father was dead? And I sort of had that ability to distance myself from anything unpleasant. And so I left the garage mechanic's house and I went for a long walk on this cold, I think it was March day, um, 
trying to assimilate it. And I did. And I thought, now I have to change the direction. I won't be going back to England. There's no one there to go back to. So I must just get on with doing the best I can in Canada. And what that meant for you was eventually getting into journalism. You were on the cover of Toronto Life magazine, its first ever issue, I think. I wonder whether at the time you can recall being, well, don't take this the wrong way. You were young, gorgeous, on the cover of magazines, trying to make it in a male-dominated world of journalism. How was, how was negotiating your way around all that? How did that work? Again, there must be something very wrong with me because I never felt that there was any kind of a glass ceiling, any kind of a problem with men. And perhaps that's the good thing about my childhood because all the women in my family worked back for three generations. Um, it, being on the cover of Toronto Life was not journalism. That was just straightforward picture taking. Um, but getting into journalism, there were a couple of moments when I was working for the CBC and I discovered that I was getting less pay than the man I was training for my job. And I was really irritated with that. So I went in and said to the producer, this is wrong. And he said, well, he has a family to support and you don't. And I thought about it and I saw the logic in that. Um, I never had any difficulty, Steve, in work. If you just work hard. And I, I appreciate, I'm not saying it was okay for me, so it's okay for everyone else. I'm just saying that in my case, if you worked really hard, you, you got where you wanted to get. Hmm. And I did work hard. I played, but I worked very, very hard. Well, I, I have to say, you don't pull any punches, never mind I'm talking about other people, but in, in particular, when you talk about yourself, you are very tough on yourself in this book. And one thing I learned, which I did not know before, is that uh, Lord Black of Cross Harbor is your fourth husband. I didn't know about three marriages before him and, and all of them evidently too problematic to get to the finish line. Now, do you regard those marriages today as mistakes? I don't, you know, I, I am incredibly philosophical and I don't mean to be philosophical, but I just don't think you can redo your life and you learn from something. I found my third marriage incredibly destructive and painful and I rather wish I hadn't had to go through that um, but it taught me a lot I was alone in England married to an absolutely charming intelligent man this David, is David Graham. Graham yes yes and he was a 47 year old bachelor when I married him he had everything that a man you could want in a man funny charming intelligent good looking successful and there was probably a reason which i should have thought of why he had never married at 47 it was a mistake in one sense because it almost destroyed me not quite i'm just too tough for that um but it got me back to england and i really wanted to go back to england not because i didn't appreciate what canada had done for me in terms of journalism um even though my writing wasn't liked in certain areas, uh, Canada had been good for me. But getting back to England where David Graham was now resident was the positive side of what came out of our marriage. And then because he was never around and I was alone, I had to try and reinvent myself in terms of English journalism. I didn't think I had a prayer because I'd been reading English columnists all my life and I thought they were far too clever and witty and erudite for me. But again, I was lucky. I worked and I got my first assignment at the Times on a Canadian topic because nobody else wanted to write about Brian Mulroney coming to England. Um, and it went from there. Well, what, what's fascinating about this, and people won't know this about you, you actually, despite having married two fairly well-off guys, and David Graham was a rich man, you did not divorce well, I have to say. You, you, you didn't come away with these marriages with very much money at all. And you get into some very... Uh, Look, I'm sorry for bringing this up here, but you do talk about it in the book. You talk about an abortion that you had decades ago. And you write in the book, I did not know this would be my single chance at having a child. And I wonder all these years later whether you regret that decision all those decades ago. I do regret it. I regret it deeply. But you know, if I lived my life again, I think I would be... Um, as foolish again. When you're a young woman, and I was a young woman, and I was, you know, hell-bent on, on getting a career, and at that time I didn't have much of a job. I was the secretary to the head of 
public affairs or something. I mean, it was a it was a secretarial job, and I thought a child is something I can't support, and it'll get in my way. I think if somebody had told me there was a way out, it could be adopted, or they could help me financially, I might have had it, but probably not. Um, I would have done exactly the same thing. Do I regret it now? Deeply, but I'm not really. I can't beat myself up on it because I know I'd do it again. Um, I always say to Conrad, you know, I'll die and there won't be anybody to remember me and there'll be no children to sort of hang around me as I become increasingly infirm and I won't see the world through their eyes. I'd love to see the world through the eyes of grandchildren, for example, um, because you see new things all the time. But that's just a part of life that was part of the price you pay for being as selfish as I was and as, as self-obsessed and driven. Hmm. You mentioned Conrad, Conrad Black, your husband, and, um, <laughs> well, I'm going to read this quote. Conrad Black hadn't the faintest idea that, for me, he was emblematic of stuffed shirt Toronto. Now, that doesn't sound like a ringing endorsement for a guy you're about to marry. So what changed? No, I wasn't about to marry him. Let's be fair. <laughs> this was when I was editor of the Toronto Sun. I was living in, in um, Canada. And I, wasn't, I was trying to get out of the lunch with Conrad, actually, um, because he was emblematic for me of what Peter Newman called the Canadian establishment. And I was never interested in businessmen. Um, I much preferred uh, European intellectuals, that sort of man. Um, I went only because my publisher, Doug Creighton, insisted I go. And I thought also he was far too clever for me. I knew that Conrad used lots of long words and he'd make references to history. And although I have an honours BA and did some graduate work, I never took the kind of courses that counted. And history is a course that counts in life. Uh, I took philosophy. You can't really use Hegel and Nietzsche as dinner table or lunch table conversation. So I was frightened of going to lunch with Conrad. And I knew he'd drink, and I didn't drink. And I'd seen establishment people when they were drinking, and I, I just didn't want that. He was very pleasant. At the end of the lunch, I thought, Phew, I got through it. Um, <laughs> but that, that was it. And he was married. And whatever else I am, I would never date a married man. I just wouldn't. And indeed, when Conrad many years, or quite a few years later, first asked me out, um, I thought he was still married to his first wife. And it wasn't until I was satisfied he was legally separated and she was with someone else that we began dating. I mean, there's, if you've been an outsider in some ways, the last thing you want to do is be the outsider with a married man whose loyalty is to his wife and family. Indeed. Now, at some point, he does ask you to marry him. And again, you tell us in the book, at that point, when he proposed, you two had not even so much as kissed. Now, did you find that a bit odd? Well, I thought it was extraordinary. Very strange. I wondered if there was something wrong with him. Um, and I, I, I actually, I couldn't understand his proposal because I liked Conrad by that point. You know, we'd been seeing each other because I knew he needed people, he was lonely, his wife and children were gone. When he proposed, he used so many literary terms and so many allusions that I wasn't quite sure whether he was asking me to have an affair or what he was doing. Um, and then I told him to go to a psychiatrist because clearly he was asking me to marry him on the rebound and that was not a good thing for him. And he did go to a psychiatrist, the head of the Tavistock Institute. And then it took I suppose it took a few months of me gradually realizing that there was so much more to him, that I could let down my guard, I could see the real Conrad. And it was, um, it was quite a romance. Well, the book is, is deeply personal about you, of course, but it's also deeply personal about him in some areas. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether or not, I mean, I assume you gave him this manuscript to look at and gave him a bit of a veto on stories that he thought were over the line. Did that happen? No. 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 I wouldn't let him see the manuscript until it was in third page galleys, at which point there's no turning back. Huh. And, um, the reason was not because I think he would have vetoed anything. Conrad is an extraordinarily tolerant man. I mean, if, if I sat down and said to him, um, Conrad, I think I'll try taking some cocaine tonight, he would say, fine. Uh, that's all right, Barbara. I'll be here to look after you. But I myself cannot do that. 
I mean, that's a silly example, but he's just an immensely tolerant man. And I knew he wouldn't veto anything in the book, but at the same time, I thought some things might upset him. Not the revelations of my sexual escapades or my view of him, but the way I handled his difficulties. I was afraid he might feel I'd handled them incorrectly. Well, let's pick up on that, since that's, uh, th that dovetails us nicely to where we want to go. Let us, uh, I guess, okay, we'll establish the following. You, uh, we talked about the fact you didn't divorce, quote unquote, well in the past, and therefore you came to your marriage with L uh, Lord Black with, with very little money, and suddenly you've got this quite wonderful lifestyle, and, uh, and you do, we should say, you don't shy away from the most famous quote you ever uttered in the book to that Vogue magazine reporter, I have an extravagance that knows no bounds. But I want to read an excerpt from the book now, and then we'll come back and, and I'll ask a question on the other side of it. As it was, you write, I sat listing our errors and our offenses as honestly as I could to make sense of it all. I clearly had an offensive, smug, and abrasive personality. We had been too blatant in our enjoyment of what Conrad calls the preferments of his position. There were just too many photos, too many pictures of us enjoying ourselves all over the place with important people. Hear Conrad on the radio, see Conrad being made a peer and complaining about the loss of his citizenship. See Barbara prancing around on the social pages of the New York Times. Read her fey comments about extravagance and clothes that gave Conrad's enemies an open sesame. People were simply tired of us, tired of our being and our bloody self-importance in the pronouncements we made verbally or in print. I, I guess I want to pick up from that and say, do you think that a lot of the eventual very zealous prosecution of him by law enforcement authorities was in part, you know, because of what you Me. two said? Well, okay, you. I wasn't going to say it, but you just said it. Yes. No, no, I mean, let's not shy away from it. And before I answer that, I'll say that I'm having some difficulty with publicizing this book because I'm afraid the same... Um, the same loop will start again. There's too much of me um, pushing this book. There's too much of me on television. So it's, it's getting increasingly painful to do these interviews. I'm just afraid of starting that off again. Um, I think that Conrad would probably have had to go through the same awful times again without me. But I think that I started it off and made it so much worse. When I gave that interview to Julia Reed at Vogue, who was a wonderful journalist who died just a couple of months ago, and she quoted it absolutely accurately. And then she wrote letters to newspapers saying she was just making fun of herself, begging them not to keep hitting me over the head with it. But I did make it. It was accurate. Um, I did spend money. It was amazing to me. I mean, I had never had this this freedom. I'd always had to earn my money, whether I was married to someone wealthy or not. I'd always had to look out for myself. And suddenly, here I was in this glittering world and, uh, uh, and attached to people who, by their nature, had their picture in the papers. Um, I think that my extravagance became something that other journalists could use to beat us over the head with. So it ignited a media firestorm, and that in turn created or added to the atmosphere around Conrad. It was a time, you remember, when um, American prosecutors were looking for high profile heads because of the Enron and WorldCom bankruptcy. Everybody wanted to have a conviction to get the next level as a prosecutor. And I think that the media firestorm around us helped get that prosecution going. It was a, it, it's an interesting thing because it started out not as a battle over how much money Conrad was making or whether he had stolen money. It started out simply, and this was really the basis of the whole thing, as one large investor wanting Conrad to sell the telegram, break up the company, and thus realize the value of the stocks. Conrad thought it hadn't reached the point where it should be broken up. Personally, I think he just didn't want to sell the telegram either, but telegraph. But that was the basis. And the only way the investor could, could get the company broken up was to get Conrad out of the company because he had the voting stocks. And the easiest way to do it in that hysterical atmosphere was to accuse him of wrongdoing. Hmm. Because just like with the Me Too situation now or the cancel culture, you don't have to prove anything. You just have to say, 
they did something wrong. And then the person's finished. Well, and one, of the th one of the things you definitely learn at a time like this, as the cliche goes, is uh, who your real friends are. Now, you name names in the book, so let's name some names here. Who was good to you and who wasn't? My English friends were good to me. My few close girlfriends were absolutely staunch. Odd people were staunch. I mean, I, I was astonished by Elton John coming to visit me when I was sitting alone in the house in London, never having contacted him, See, you know, being to dinner with him a few times. Um, in Canada, uh, I had less friends because I hadn't really made them. I'd been so busy working. Well, your but hairdresser fired you. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people fired me. <laughs> Robert I was, Gage, very I, famous the, hairdresser. He said, don't come the, in anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was toxic. You know, uh, um, you didn't want to be with me. And because I knew I was toxic, the people that probably would have helped me, I withdrew from seeing them. Um, I was even, a, I was a burden to my English friends because they kept getting called up by newspapers or television producers or whatever to give them anecdotes about me. And that gets very tiresome for people. Um, so the people that I really despise are not the journalists who wrote badly about me. That was their job. They didn't know me. They did a magpie run of the clippings. I can't blame them. And I can't blame them for not understanding the financial complexity and realizing what was going on. The journalists that I don't like are the ones who absolutely out of whole cloth invented things. I mean, I was bad enough. They had enough material to go <laughs> on. They didn't need to invent stuff. And, and those I, I, uh, I don't like. I loathe the lawyers. Um, Earl Cherniak is an exception. And there were a few exceptions. My, my American lawyer that I finally got was wonderful. Our appeal lawyer was wonderful. By and large, people uh, like the person that presided over Conrad's hearing of the OSC, Madam Jenner, these were just absolutely horrible people. And they, they understood nothing. They read nothing. The only person I have a lot of time for was the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, <laughs> because she wrote the judgment that vacated all the convictions against Conrad. And she said that the, the judge had instructed the jury wrongly. And she told the appeals judge that he had created new law to convict Conrad. And I really, I really mourned her passing on a number of levels. Hmm. I should ask you, uh, since we are so close to Election Day in the United States, about... Um... <laughs> I see the look on your <laughs> face already, but here we go. Um, your husband and I have had some very wonderful, enjoyable, and sparky conversations about Donald Trump, uh, who I think it's fair to say many people feel is uh, completely unfit for the job, and it's an empirically provable fact that he's a disgraceful human being and uh, with an authoritarian streak, and we could go on. Your husband obviously uh, is partial to his policies and is um, uh, grateful to him for the pardon he received. I understand that. What's your take on Donald Trump? Well, we have a sort of Trump-free zone in this house. <laughs> um, and I meet my husband every night for Fox News, um, and I busily with the dishes. My take on Donald Trump is somewhat different. Um, I think that in spite of his manner, which I find absolutely excruciating, and I found the last debate the most horrible thing I've ever watched. It reminded me of every abusive husband yelling at every wife I could think of. <laughs> but I find that his policies, I'd, I'd vote for him for two reasons. I don't know anyone else who helped the black people, Afro-Americans, that I sat with in those prison waiting rooms. Nobody else has helped them, and he was the first person that has. And his policies, and I mean, it's extraordinary because people don't understand that in Canada. He's been the only president who's helped those people. Um, uh, Afro-Americans are in prison in numbers that they should not be. Um, they've had rotten schools. Uh, they've had, life has just kept grinding them down. And I have no idea why Trump decided early on in his presidency that he was going to make a hack into that and really start the prison reform that no one else did. But he did. And he set up opportunity zones. So I take that really as a really remarkable thing to do. Um, do you hope he's reelected? 
well, you know, this is difficult. I suppose I just could not see America under a president that is as challenged as Joe Biden and whose policies, I think, have never helped the lower classes and I think would wreck the American economy. I mean, if I were American, frankly, I'd stay home on Election Day. It's, it's just a, a very, very difficult time for American voters. Even though Trump plays footsie with white supremacists and militias and this type of thing? He doesn't. He really doesn't. Look, uh, I think he misses... I think he's idiotic in not being more clear. I mean, he has, he has condemned the Ku Klux Klan, he has condemned white supremacists, but it's a kind of streak, I think, and I'm just, I'm just speculating, it's a streak of stubborn pride in him not to go on about it because he can't believe that people think he's a racist. And anyone who knows his employment policies would know that he isn't. There's, there's a curiously adolescent quality about him that goes hand in hand with an absolutely instinctive brilliance for policy. It's a very odd combination. But to quote my husband, who I, I often do quote, um, central casting doesn't give you the kind of president you need for, for bad times. Hmm. And America was having bad times, and it didn't throw up a, an FDR, it didn't throw up a JFK, it threw up Donald Trump. And he's not central casting's idea of a, of a great president, but his policies have been, before COVID, extremely beneficial to all classes of Americans. I think he was disorganized on COVID, um, I don't know that anyone else would have done much better because closing the borders to China was a pretty important thing to do. Um, I, the tax breaks to billionaires, I think he gave them to corporations um, and that increased job prospects. But I am not an economist. I can't tell you about that. No, I just remember him walking into Mar-a-Lago and looking at his billionaire friends and saying, I made you all a lot richer today. Anyway, That's exactly the kind of thing he would say. Yes. I mean, isn't, it's awful, isn't it? I mean, it's the kind of thing that just, it's like nails on a blackboard. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's finish up on this. I, I, um, I got to say, I, the, the very end of the book you write, I'm going to try to enjoy the remaining time left to me and bugger off to the whole damn lot of you. We're still here. You lost. And I guess the, the, the question I have emerging from that is, how important is it for you through this book and otherwise, to show the world that Barbara Emil and Conrad Black can take the best punch that society has to offer and they can get up off the canvas and get back at it? I don't think it's important for me to show the world. Um, it's important for me to tell Conrad that I'm all right, we're here, because you see, he has no problems. He feels that he won. He feels that he was on a mission, that there were as a principle and that he survived it because people wanted him to be absolutely flattened and never be seen again. And, and when I say that at the end of the book, it's really, um, it's really a vow of confidence in my husband. It's a feeling that I don't want to think about this anymore. I don't, uh, we've gone through 17 years of this. We've missed 17 years of normal life together, of freedom, to think about something other than lawyers and money and survival. And bugger off everyone. I'm going to enjoy my husband now. <laughs> well, your husband was the first ever guest on this program 15 years ago, and I am is delighted. That, true? that is true. And I am delighted that, um, well, it took us 15 years to get you here, but I'm glad it finally happened. So thank you. I'm thrilled. Thank you very much indeed. Friends and That's Enemies, a memoir by Barbara Emile. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.